Well, I got into bike racing, a uh, little stroke of luck really that I stumbled upon it. Um, always been kind of ridden my bike when I was a young boy, ride it to, we rode it everywhere. Um, went to our baseball games and everything uh, in the summertime. Um, but I, I kind of stumbled upon the St. Catherine Cycling Club in the spring of 1974. And uh, right out of the blocks, I mean, I was competitive with a lot of young boys the same age that had been racing for more than a couple years. And they said, why don't you come out with the club? And I was kind of interested. And uh, uh, it just sprung into something very special. Within six weeks of uh, get, even getting a bicycle and trying to compete at a, a, on a provincial level, I did win the provincial sprint title. Um, and two weeks later, I finished second in Canada for 17 and under. So that kind of was like the the earmark that like uh, this is going to be something exciting. I really like this. And I just finished high school, finished grade 12, and I was kind of geared to go back for grade 13. But I had the bug. I really wanted to do this. And in the fall of 1974, so I'd raced all that summer as a 17-year-old. Um, Montreal, the city of Montreal, hosted the World Cycling Championships, and it was a precursor to the Olympics, which were to follow in 1976. So they were staging this major event to see how they could handle all the production and block off the roads and everything. And a bunch of us went up to Montreal by the train. It was kind of exciting and. Um, so I'd won a few races and I watched the actual world championship and I remember seeing the legendary great, you'll have to look this up on Google, the legendary great Eddie Merckx win the world road race championship. And, I, and he got the world championship jersey and I remember watching the presentation and I remember thinking as a kid, this is kind of the dream you have, I got to get one of those. <laughs> and that's what got me started. Reg Harris, five times world champion, just after World War II through the early 50s. Um, absolutely iconic gentleman. And when I went to Britain to race at 18, um, I had lunch with him. And for me, that was like meeting Gordy Howe. You know, this is, he was one of the greatest. And this gentleman is Torchy Peden, and Torchy Peden raced indoor back in the 20s. Uh, he's from Vancouver, so he's Canadian. Uh, one of the greatest cyclists that ever put his leg over a bike. We're very proud to have him in the Canadian Cycling Hall of Fame um, and being Canadian. And he won uh, a multitude of racing. You have to look his name up. And in the 20s, Torchy was making as much money as Babe Ruth. Well, I went to one Olympics as a competitor, which was 1976. I was 19 years old, um, been racing for 12 months. Um, it really is a tremendous feeling. I, I'm very patriotic when it comes down to that. Um, but to walk into the main stadium in your host country and you're wearing the Canadian blazer and they're waving the flag is something very, very special. And uh, it, it's, it's something we share. And not everybody gets to do that, you know, and Canada sends, you know, three, four hundred athletes every Olympics to do that. So it's kind of a, a club, you know, and, and it, it's very special to be able to do that. Um, and I'm very proud to do that. Now, the following Olympics in 1980, which I was a member of the Canadian team, the Olympics were in Moscow and Canada was uh, followed suit with the Americans, which boycotted the Olympics in Moscow due to the Russians invading Afghanistan and Jimmy Carter was the president and uh, going into that Olympics in Moscow by, by 1980 from when I started in 74 um, I climbed up the world rankings and I was the number two seed going to Moscow and I didn't go. This particular bike here called the Carlton was owned by one of my coaches his name was Norman Scheel Back in the mid-50s, Norman was two times world champion in the 4,000 meter pursuit. Um, Norman was from Liverpool, uh, Britain. When he won his titles, he ended up moving to Canada and he became Canada's national coach in the late 70s and early 80s. And he finished his life uh, living in Virgil. So I got to see him a lot. It was really good. Um, and this was his track bike. And uh, I'm really proud to be able to own that. 
This particular uh, white bicycle here is very special to me. Um, in 1980, after we had the Olympic boycott in Moscow, the Canadian government funded a special program for me. And um, I chose to go down to Mexico City, which was at altitude, and I attempted to break three of the world records, the 200 meter, the 500 meter, and the 1000 meter. And I did all three in one day, and it's never been done again since. Um, I was the first one to do it, and I'm still the only one that's ever done it. Um, this particular bike, um, at the time I, it says AMF on it, I was sponsored by AMF in the States, but it was made in uh, Montreal by a great frame builder named Giuseppe Marinoni. Um, and he was wonderful to a lot of uh, young cyclists like myself. And this bike was state of the art in 1980. Um, this bike with the jerseys hanging on it was the bicycle that I won the uh, world championship on in 1982 in Leicester, Britain. Um, I was the first Canadian ever to win a World Cycling Championship and uh, this is the bicycle here and it's pretty much original. My impact on cycling Niagara Falls, well I go back to what I would consider the beginning of bicycle racing in Niagara Falls. And at the time it was interesting, I would won a provincial title, Canadian title and the sports editor of the Niagara Falls Review was Doug Austin and he wouldn't write about it in the paper. And uh, our, our legendary uh, talk show host John Michael got on the bandwagon. He thought it was something special so I give him some credit for that and uh, he embarrassed him into starting to write about it. That was back in 1975. Um, by 76, I mean, I'm going to the Olympics, I'm winning some things internationally. He had no choice but to kind of realize this was happening. Um, one of the little claims to fame that I tell people is kind of a funny story, but um, in 76, I was the first one in Niagara Falls to wear spandex, and everybody's wearing it now, so it's a trendsetter. But the sport has evolved tremendously. I mean, uh, we've got a local Niagara Falls club now called Amici Perlavita. Um, my wife and I belong to it. it. It's a recreational club. I call it, we're a little more mature. Um, we, we're completely organized with organized rides and ride leaders and we have tailgate parties and barbecues and socials and, and we do hundreds and hundreds and thousands of kilometers as a club every year. Um, so, I mean, and our club has over a hundred members and you go on the roads today and riding around and you see all kinds of people, uh, local businessmen, businesswomen, um, they've all got bikes and of course the sports springboarded into uh, the spin-offs of triathlon and there, there's Grand Fondos now and people doing uh, rides for charity and they have to have expensive bikes and have all the stuff on and look really cool so it's really come a long way from when I started. <music>